Welcome to Down Ancient Trails, the online archaeology forum of the Sharma Center for Heritage Education India. Brush the dust of long forgotten thoughts. Slice through time and space. Listen to stories in stone. Whispers of voices lost in time. Build bridges across worlds. Curious minds reach out to the past. And travel down ancient trails. So, um, Welcome everyone to this uh, session of uh, uh, Down Ancient Trails of the Sharma Center for Heritage Education. And today we are absolutely delighted to have with us here Professor Ajit Prasad from the MS University of Baroda, very, very renowned scholar and well known to all of us here in archaeology. And he's going to speak in the Herd and Harvest series which we are running just now on the very interesting topic of hunter-gatherer transition and Gujarat. So I'll hand you over to Shutanuka to introduce our speaker and the topic which he's going to speak about today. Over to you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, just a very small introduction to Professor Ajit Prasad. I'm sure for most of us, he doesn't need any introduction. Professor Ajit Prasad is working at the Department of Archaeology and Ancient History at the MS University, Baroda, Gujarat, since 1990. His research interests are in Stone Age prehistory and Harappan archaeology. His research in Paleolithic archaeology is mainly focused in the Oshang and the Sabarmati Valleys in the eastern margins of Gujarat and of the late, the Kutch regions of the Northwest. He has also investigated the hunter-gatherer transition and the beginning of agro-pastoral and early Harappan settlements in North Gujarat. He's currently involved in Paleolithic investigations <clears throat> investigations in Kutch along with the early Harappan and Harappan cultural development in Gujarat. His topic for the day is hunter-gatherer transition in Gujarat. This abstract is available at our website. Anybody who wish to look into it further can always check it at our website. Before taking any much more of your time, I will just have a small request that please do not take any recording or screenshot of the talk. And before taking any more of your time, thank you so much, uh, Professor Prasad, for joining us today. And I'll hand over the screen to you. So thank you, uh, uh, Professor Ajit Prasad, for uh, agreeing to be and uh, agreeing to speak on this forum today. And we are delighted to have you here. We hand, hand the um, forum over to you. Okay. Um, am I audible? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's fine. Um, can sir, I you can sh share your sharing? screen, sir. Yes. Okay. One minute. As always, you can add your questions, participants, in the chat mode, and he will get back to you at the end of the talk. Share screen. Yes. I yes. hope you are able to see it. Yes, you can make it full screen. I'll make it full screen. Is that okay? Perfect. Yes, perfect. perfect. Okay. Yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, thanks very much uh, uh, for this invitation to talk on hunter gatherer transition in Gujarat to uh, Sharma Education, uh, Sharma Center for uh, Heritage Education. Um, Shanti and her old colleagues, those who are actually kind of carrying out this wonderful job uh, since the beginning of the pandemic, I suppose. And um, it has been actually a pleasure to, I suppose, um, listen many of the talks, which has been actually kind of um, uh, uh, kind of organized by this uh, platform. And today uh, I am actually going to talk about the uh, transition of uh, hunters and gatherers into food producing way of life in Gujarat. Um, and this is a work which I have been actually carrying out, we have been actually, the MS University, 
uh, have actually been uh, carrying out for the last uh, more than 15 years. Um, you know, as you all know that uh, uh, the beginning of agro-pastoral way of life uh, or, or the farming way of life, in fact, is a, a complex uh, issue, uh, which certainly involves diverse agents of change. Uh, you know, the change probably may come from uh, uh, different um, activities, different areas, which includes environmental changes or the, uh, the changes in the uh, cultural behavior um, uh, many other uh, uh, many other factors actually uh, kind of contribute towards this change or actually kind of triggers this change. Um, but what is interesting is that uh, uh, farming uh, way of life actually provides concrete evidence of cultural diversity. Of course, cult cultural diversity would have been there even earlier, but they are not so tangible and readable in the archaeological records. But when it comes to the uh, farming way of life, we have multiple proxies, which will actually help us to understand the cultural diversity. Uh, so in that sense, it is an important stage, uh, you know, where um, our, our ancestors actually kind of learned uh, uh, to produce food um, um, and it actually kind of um, happened um, in different parts of the world at different times. And uh, um, there are different plants and animals which are actually involved in this process. So we will actually see when exactly and uh, how exactly uh, this transition from hunting and gathering way of life actually happened in Gujarat. Um, as we actually know, um, uh, this uh, uh, in, in, in our country, we actually talk about um, uh, five or six major, um, uh, what is known as um, farming zones or neolithic zones. Uh, among these, the most important ones or the two important ones, in fact, the one in the northwest uh, 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 of our subcontinent, today's Pakistan. Um, the type site here is Mahargar, which has been actually dated around, uh, you know, the beginning of 8th millennium BC or the middle of the 8th millennium BC. And then you have almost equally early is the evidence which we have from Central Ganga Basin. Um, we have several sites in that region which actually uh, belong to the Mesolithic as well as the subsequent Neolithic uh, periods or food producing uh, stages. Um, uh, there are many other centers here. Uh, apart from these two, we have uh, uh, in Kashmir, there is a center and we also have, uh, that is the part is not the Northern Neolithic. And then we have in peninsular India, I suppose, a major center, what we call the Southern Neolithic, uh, which has its own character and complexities. And, and then there are also in, uh, in, in, in the eastern part of India, Orissa and the adjoining region, the Chotanagpur Plateau, which also show a kind of, um, you know, agricultural or farming uh, way of life developing uh, quite independently. And similar uh, evidence are also found from the Northeast. But from, um, from among all these things, I suppose um, very concrete evidence for transition of hunting and uh, gathering way of life to food producing way of life actually are seen uh, uh, mostly in the Northwest Mahaga, uh, where you actually come across where uh, Richard Mito, in fact, has actually shown how uh, uh, the transition is actually manifested in, in the cattle domestication, where the size of the cattle bones actually kind of um, uh, started, uh, you know, from the base with mean, the early levels to the later levels, it actually reduced, uh, 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 indicating the, the process of domestication very clearly in the archaeological evidence in that region, which happened to be one of the earliest in the subcontinent. Similar sort of evidence are actually not found in anywhere else. So a potential area, obviously, is um, is the north, uh, the uh, uh, central Ganga region where we have Loradeva and many other sites. Loradeva, specifically, where we have uh, um, uh, domesticated, uh, cultivated rice, um, which goes back as early as that period. Uh, but then we actually do not have uh, 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 evidence to kind of support uh, the process of domestication through age, through through time, actually, kind of uh, um, you know happening from the Mesolithic stage to the next Neolithic stage. Um, in fact, no other center actually has shown uh, these kind of evidence what we have seen in the Northwestern part of India. Uh, it probably would be there in other places as, as well, probably no concerted effort 
uh, has actually been made to, to understand the process uh, uh, you know, by looking at the uh, different proxies of transition, both archeological, environmental, um, when I say archeological, which I, what I mean is that both flora and uh, floral and faunal evidence, which we have from hunting and gathering way of life to life to uh, food producing way of life. Uh, 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 you know, there is also a new center which has actually come up that is in the Gagar Saraswati system, which, which actually shows a very early date going back to almost the sixth millennium BC, where we have fully domesticated cattle, uh, uh, cattle bones um, and settled way of life along with the early chalcolithic, uh, 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 you know, evidence of early chalcolithic occupations. Um, there are a series of date, um, which essentially, if the dates are actually correct, which essentially says that there is something happening in this region very early. But then uh, all those, um, um, the, the issue in here in, in Gagar Saraswati system, in fact, is we do not have a very good Mesolithic substratum. In other words, you know, um, uh, the food producing way of life suddenly emerges in that region. There are no Mesolithic sites uh, uh, reported from that region uh, in, in the Gagar Saraswati system. Uh, 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 that in fact is an issue which needs to be, it is actually a challenge for archeologists to actually see uh, how exactly food producing way of life actually started so early in that region, without a Mesolithic stratum, are we completely missing this Mesolithic stratum in here for some reason? But in, 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 in this scenario, Gujarat does not actually fit anywhere because there are no Neolithic sites in this, in, in this region. The earliest settled way of life actually starts with the, the Indus civilization. Uh, which is which was actually thought to be just 2500 BC, that is the urban phase of Indus civilization. Uh, but then Gujarat actually has a, a large number of uh, uh, very rich Mesolithic settlements uh, uh, characterized by uh, microlithic artifacts and all other uh, kinds of artifacts which we generally associate with the with the uh, uh, microblade industry, which immediately preceded food producing way of life. Um, um, uh, but then the transition from that stage to the food producing way of stage, I mean, uh, a Neolithic phase was actually found to be completely, completely absent uh, in, in the region. So um, uh, this, uh, in fact, was actually to Yes, um, uh, this was to change, you know. Uh, so what has been actually thought uh, um, till very recently that it was the, the, the urban Harappans, those who actually started moving out of the Indus Valley towards the south and towards the east, they actually sort of produce, introduced uh, the food producing way of life in Gujarat. Uh, um, so that in fact was the, the concept or the model which has been actually used to understand the beginning of food producing way of life. Uh, in Gujarat, you know, um, in spite of the fact that we have very rich, a large number of Mesolithic sites in this region. Uh, this was actually, uh, uh, this actually changed um, in, the, the, in the late 1980s and the 1990s as we actually came across um, a number of uh, early Chalcolithic settlements which actually dated uh, almost thousand years earlier than the beginning of, I mean, uh, in the civilization, I mean, urban phase of the Indus civilization. Um, and many of these sites are actually found, uh, uh, actually uh, concentrated in Northern part of Gujarat. And then few of them are actually found in the, in the Saurashtra coast. So um, these are the date for these, these are all early, what you call the Chalcolithic settlement. We actually do come across some kind of pottery, which is not necessarily very similar to the Indus Valley pottery, very different, but essentially affili probably affiliated to, uh, with that. Um, and then the, they all actually showed use of uh, copper implements to a certain extent. Um, and then uh, you, have, uh, uh, you have domesticated uh, cattle uh, uh, at sheep and goat slightly later in time uh, in these early Chalcolithic settlements. Uh, um, so this is what actually kind of uh, uh, brought the potential of investigating hunter-gatherer transition in, 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 in this region. Um, uh, the hunting-gathering way of life in, in, at this, uh, in, in Gujarat has been actually found to be going back to 8 million in BC. Few of the dates actually now we have actually goes back to 7,500 BC to 7,000 BC. 
so that is eighth millennium BC, and then the and the and the chalcolithic way of life, which is the earliest food producing way of life or the farming way of life, actually started around three thousand seven hundred BC. Um, so, uh, what we actually thought was that if you have very rich Mesolithic uh, settlements in this region. Um, and also very early, you know, uh, food producing chalcolithic settlement, uh, uh, would the Mesolithic communities actually uh, kind of contributed uh, in the beginning of food producing way of life in that region or not? Um, uh, how do we that kind of uh, investigate whether uh, the Mesolithic hunters and gatherers, did they actually take, uh, did any one of the, what we call the subsistence strategies actually were tending towards food producing way of life and what contribution did they actually make in, 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 the, in the emergence of farming way of life or agro-pastoral way of life in, in Gujarat. This in fact was the questions which we asked. In order to answer these questions, we actually kind of put up a project what is generally known as North Gujarat Archaeological Project um, uh, with our university, MS University of Baroda and um, IMFC SIC Barcelona. Um, uh, with archaeologists, uh, primarily uh, um, um, archaeobotanists and uh, uh, env uh, environmental archaeologists uh, um, um, uh, from, uh, from that institute and MS University, uh, our department. Uh, and the objective, in fact, essentially was who were the first, the question we asked essentially was who were the first farmers of Gujarat? And what role did the Mesolithic hunter gatherers play in the emergence of farming way of life in Gujarat? And, um, and uh, equally important, you know, when we say what role did the Mesolithic hunter gatherers play, what we were essentially planning to investigate that whether they, they uh, what kind of step did they actually take that, uh, that contributed toward the emergence of food producing way of life. And then we, we were also aware of the fact that these hunters and gatherers, in fact, that hunting and gathering way of life actually continued for a long period of time. And they actually, you know, existed along with the, uh, the Harappa culture in the peripheral regions of uh, Harappan habitation. So there, uh, obviously there was interaction, uh, uh, you know, uh, between the hunters and gatherers and then and, and the chalcolithic communities or the food producing communities um, in the neighboring regions what a role that interaction actually played in the spread of uh, uh, agricultural way of life, agro-pastoral way of life. Uh, these were the questions which we actually kind of initially kind of posed um, uh, uh, to answer uh, in the archeological record. And for that, we actually chose no North Gujarat. Why North Gujarat? Primarily because it actually kind of uh, preserved a very rich archeological records of both the Mesolithic and also of uh, uh, the early chalcolithic or early agro-pastoral communities. And many a times they are actually found to be overlapping. So here is a, uh, it's a, it's a, uh, a good situation for an archeologist to investigate the, uh, the, 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 uh, the role of Mesolithic hunters uh, and gatherers in the food producing way of life. And um, um, uh, in addition to that, North Gujarat, in fact, as you know, is located on the southern margins of the Thar Desert. It's actually um, uh, climatically very sensitive. At the moment, North Gujarat is quite arid, you know, um, arid to semi-arid. Uh, uh, that is a climatic zone it may actually fall in. So uh, since it is actually located in a, in, a, in a climatically sensitive zone, small changes in the climate will actually uh, get uh, 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 get get significantly uh, affected uh, on the life of uh, in the life of uh, uh, the Mesolithic hunters and gatherers. We can actually see that actually manifested in the archaeological record. Uh, so um, uh, that, in fact, was the the uh, the reason we actually kind of chose North Gujarat. It is in fact this can actually be replicated in other areas where we have similar kind of evidence. Um, you know where we have. Uh, the Mesolithic settlements, uh, uh, primarily hunting and gathering way of life and subsequently followed by the food producing way of life. So this in fact is a map which actually shows North Gujarat where we have more than 120 chalcolithic sites. Um, uh, um, they all primarily belong to the Indus civilization, you know, and Indus civilization, as you know, uh, uh, starting from the early Harappan, uh, uh, now we know that in North Gujarat it starts from 3700 BC, it continues up to 1300 BC. More, many of these sites, in fact, are of uh, um, after 2500 BC. Very few are actually earlier than 
3000 BC or 2500 BC. And within that, only a handful of them are only around 3600 or 3700 BC. <clears throat> so you have a <clears throat> more than 120, excuse me, uh, 120 sites of uh, the uh, the of uh, 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 the Harappan affiliation, and we also have uh, a more than 50, you know, uh, uh, Mesolithic sites. So, uh, as of, uh, so the, we have uh, equal number of uh, actually uh, both the Mesolithic and Chalcolithic uh, settlements, and we actually kind of from among these sites, we actually selected a few sites, a key, what we call a key sites to kind of investigation. Uh, before we actually go into the nitty gritty of the investigation, I will just want to introduce you about the cultural and chronological sequence of North, North Gujarat as we know it today. We have the Mesolithic or primarily based on the microbread industries uh, that in fact formed the earliest uh, uh, habitation here uh, of the Holocene. Um, so what you can actually see is that uh, the dates actually vary from uh, different sites. These are the sites which we had actually kind of investigated, um, 7,500 to 5,600 BCE. It may continue, it, may, it certainly did continue uh, uh, later, but these are the sites which we have from those sites, uh, pretty early uh, dates. And then you ha have uh, for, the, for the early Chalcolithic uh, uh, or what we call the first farmers, uh, we have uh, 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 different uh, what we call the Chalcolithic uh, assemblages which we come across in, in, in North Gujarat itself, the, the earliest of which is what we call the uh, regional Chalcolithic culture, uh, which happened to be one of the early dated going back to 3700 BC from Loteshwar. And then you also have uh, uh, another assemblage, what, what is described as pre -prabhas. Uh, these are old names which actually describe ceramic assemblages and associated artifact assemblages, which are found uh, distinctly, distinctly different from each other. Uh, um, so this has been dated now from 3300 BC to 2900 BC. Uh, uh, that's actually come from Datrana. And then you also have this uh, 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 particular assemblage, which actually shows uh, a lot of similarities with the early Harappan materials, which you actually come across in the, in the Indus Valley, especially in the, in the middle Indus Valley. This has been actually dated around 2900 BC to 2500 BC. Then you have, of course, all the, the Harappan, which everyone of us know, the, the, there are more than 700 Harappan sites, uh, or 750 Harappan sites in, in, in Gujarat. So we will actually be focusing on uh, these cultural assemblages for understanding the understand the hunter-gatherer transition. <clears throat> so I've been talking about the I, uh, talking about the uh, you know uh, the environment of North Gujarat um, um, uh, uh, environmental setting. It's actually located in the southern fringes of the Thar Desert. So in the summer, this is not even summer. This is actually in the end of uh, end of November, December. You can see it is already dried up. In the summer, it is almost barren. Um, so um, it's a totally different landscape when you go in the summer. Uh, you know, um, hardly any any green uh, uh, greenery around except tall trees, which still may be standing in the fields. But then, when you, you go into the winter, <clears throat> excuse me. What you actually come uh, when you go in the monsoon? What you actually come across is that. Uh, a lot of these interdunal depressions, you know, North Gujarat is actually dominated by fossil sand dunes. And then you have this interdunal depression, which actually is, a, is the water source for the villages, even modern villages, as well as probably even for the, for the Mesolithic, as well as the Chalcolithic uh, 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 farming communities. And this is how it will look like, you know, every, uh, every nook and corner you actually come across this, uh, these depressions, which actually retains water, and the landscape completely transforms itself into, into, into quite green. And, uh, uh, and it is at this time, a lot of agriculture actually happens. Um, so this, this is what we actually uh, experience in North Gujarat. This is what actually helped Mesolithic hunters and gatherers to actually survive uh, in such a harsh environment, like, you know, the, the rainfall here is, actually varies from 250 mm or sometimes 200 mm to 600 mm. So it's arid to semi-arid environment. Um, uh, for understanding the, uh, uh, the, you know, we kind of looked at primarily, 
Dr. looked at um, uh, uh, three important aspects about uh, about the food producing way of life. First of all, we actually looked at looked at what are the stimulus motivation for the hunters and gatherers, whether it actually came from uh, this uh, from internal factors. When I say uh, uh, you know from the uh, from the internal factor, and what one actually um, uh, talk about is the population increase or uh, uh, so that there is a reduction in the in the resources that are actually available. So the 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 hunters and gatherers are, are therefore actually you know forced to change their hunting strategies uh, or food procurement strategies. So that can actually be reflected in the in the archaeological record. Um, so that is what uh, uh, the, uh, what we actually kind of uh, uh, aimed at investigating. And then the, the second one was the external tra tra uh, trajectory. Uh, that actually deals with the stimuli coming from external source. Uh, in this particular case, uh, that there are what you call uh, uh, food producing communities, which has already emerged in the in, in the Indus Valley, as we know that Mahergar and the and this uh, and the neighboring region, we have a food producing way of life emerged somewhere around 7,500 BC. So they certainly was actually expanding, uh, you know. Uh, uh, as and as and when the time actually passed, so that certainly would have an impact on hunters and gatherers, Mesolithic hunters and gatherers. Did that uh, uh, did, did that process actually impact it upon the beginning of food producing way of life in in North Gujarat? That is that is a, that is what we meant by investigating the external uh, uh, trajectory, um, and then. And then the other concern, in fact, was the uh, looking at both both internal and external uh, uh, trajectories, uh, the stimuli from both internal and external sources through interactive social dynamics. This is where the interaction between the Mesolithic communities, you know, in in, in the same region, as well as the Mesolithic, as well as the uh, food producers, those who are actually coming from probably from the Indus Valley because that is the nearest region we can actually think of have already into food producing agro-pastoral way of life. There must have been certainly moving down into, uh, into Gujarat. Um, and then um, uh, is that reflected in the archeological record? These are the, uh, uh, these along with the internal, what is known as stimuli, uh, uh, whether both of them actually contributed in the, in the beginning of food producing way of life. These were the, the primary concern when we actually started off our studies uh, um, in here. So uh, what we did was that, uh, uh, of uh, dust mesolithic assemblage in North Gujarat, so uh, resource management strategies leading towards food production. This is what uh, by internal strategy, what we meant, uh, internal stimuli, what we meant, uh, for which we actually kind of looked at two major investigative fields. Uh, we first of all looked at the evidence for uh, diversification of food waste. That is what, uh, uh, you know, hunting, under, hunting gathering societies generally do when, uh, when the, when the, uh, when the when there is a stress in the in the uh, uh, you know food base, it, they actually kind of add up and then expand the food base um, uh, by adopting different strategies, which eventually lead to what is known as food producing way of life uh, or the uh, agro pastoral way of life. Animals will be exploited intensively, plants will be exploited uh, more intensively, resulting into the the beginning of a uh, food producing way of life. Um, so in, in order to, do, uh, to understand this diversification of food base, we actually kind of selected the three key sites in North Gujarat. Um, uh, uh, one of these sites is Loteshwar. Uh, these are all actually nearby sites. Um, um, and they all actually showed um, some evidence of both Mesolithic, uh, um, uh, you know, and the Chalcolithic uh, remains, uh, Loteshwar, Datrana, and Wahur Votimbo. These were the three sites which we actually excavated in 2009, 10, and 11, uh, yeah. And that is where these sites are actually located. You have Lotesher, in fact, is the first one to be excavated. Um, as you can see, this, this is a site which is located and uh, all these sites, in fact, are actually located uh, in, the, in, the, in the margins of the little run of Kutch. Okay, Lotesher, in fact, is more interior. Wahurvo uh, and Lotesher are not very far away. Uh, they are actually separated by only five kilometers, um, something around about 30 to 40 kilometers from the margins of the little town of Kutch. Whereas Tatrana, in fact, is on the on the on the margin of it. It is just not even half a kilometer, just uh, 
uh, uh, as close as that. So these are the three sites which we actually kind of investigated in order to understand this hunting and uh, uh, undergatherer transition. Um, <clears throat> So um, this is a big, bigger map, which actually shows the position of these sites. As you actually see, that is Lotesho. Um, um, and then, uh, then this is where Wahurvo Chimbo, that is another site which we excavated, that is the last site to be excavated. And this one is Dadrana. Um, these two sites, Lotesho uh, and uh, uh, Dadrana, in fact, uh, have both the Chalcolithic, as you can see, and the Mesolithic as well as the, the early Chalcolithic settlements uh, in a stratified context. Whereas uh, uh, Datrana also has the Mesolithic as well as the early Harappan or Triprabhas uh, and Anarda. So it's a mixture of many things in a small uh, uh, little habitational uh, deposit at that, that site, very interesting site, which is located at the, at the, just at the margin of the, the run of uh, uh, Kutch. And, uh, Waharuvo Timpo, in fact, um, uh, 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 is primarily a Mesolithic settlement. It has no early Harappan, except probably at the top, a few early Harappan burials. Um, uh, they, 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 this site was actually kind of taken up for excavation uh, just to see the Mesolithic, uh, you know, not being kind of occupied by the early Harappan. But we, in, the, in, the, in the process of excavation, we found that it also had uh, 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 some flimsy evidence of early Harappan uh, habitation uh, at the site. Um, in any case, um, uh, that actually turned out to be a blessing in disguise, which so that we were able to kind of understand the process of domestication uh, much better with, uh, with interesting evidence uh, uh, from that particular site. So that is the time uh, uh, which we uh, will be talking about, Mesolithic 7,500 uh, uh, 7, BC, the Anartha Chalcolithic has been dated to 3600 or 3700 BC. And the Priprabhas that is in here, Datrana, that is around 3000 to 3300 BC. Just, uh, we will actually first see the kind of evidence for the Mesolithic settlements at Loteshwar. Um, uh, that is the Loteshwar site, which is actually located, uh, uh, located on top of a stabilized sand dune. Um, in and around, you do actually, if you stand on this mound, you can actually see a number of such eminents, uh, which are all fossil sand dunes, uh, which are uh, all under cultivation now. Um, uh, so this is, in fact, is a site, um, it is under cultivation. And uh, this, this is a site which we actually uh, excavated in 1991, many years back. That is what actually brought in the, uh, the significance or importance of this site for understanding the, uh, the transition. And, um, and uh, it is based on that excavation, uh, in which, carried out, which was carried out in 1990, when we actually kind of uh, set up this project about understanding hunting and gathering way of life. And it's a very strange site, as you can see, the Chalcolithic or the early uh, uh, agro-pastoral settlement, uh, but it's generally described as Anarda Chalcolithic because Anarda is the traditional name uh, of North Gujarat. Um, uh, that is actually found uh, in the upper layers, um, just uh, you know, a 50 centimeter maximum. But then you do actually come across very deep pits, which are actually cut by this, uh, the Chalcolithic uh, uh, agro-pastoral uh, uh, communities, so, uh, a number of such pits. And then you mark these, these pits are all at the bottom of them, are all quite flat, very significant and interesting why these pits are deep. These, uh, we believe these were actually storage pits. And then uh, the Mesolithic is actually the bottom most, which has been dated to around 7,100 or 7,000 BC. And this is, this is a kind of third layer, what you, uh, where my cursor moves, is actually a kind of, um, uh, the, uh, you know, where you actually come across a transition or a mixed kind of uh, uh, transition in the sense that not real transition, it's actually kind of, uh, the, 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 the top of Mesolithic and the bottom of the, of the Chalcolithic has been actually kind of uh, uh, mixed up. Uh, the context has been actually mixed. So uh, uh, one has to actually kind of treat the elements which are coming from this very, very carefully, whether it actually belong to Mesolithic or the Chalcolithic. Uh, so um, uh, you, we have a series of dates uh, from this site, um, which you can actually see that many of these samples were collected from uh, 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 these pits, 
So there was a lot of uh, kind of apprehensions or doubts about whether these dates could actually be correct. So we actually did a, a series of dates to kind of um, kind kind of um, override those doubts and found that the the, uh, the 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 dates are very consistent and they actually uh, show uh, uh, the Mesolithic. Uh, uh, settlements actually dating back to you can see a series of dates going back to 7,100 uh, BC, and this dating has been done by from by uh, by the charred bone, um, which has clearly collected from the Mesolithic uh, context. Uh, so uh, and charred bone of a wild animal, so that actually gives a date wild antelope uh, uh, gives a date of 7,100 BC. And for the and for the child politics, the date is around uh, 3,700, 3,600 BC, as you can actually see. So one of the very early dated Mesolithic as well as the child politics sites in, in, in Western India. Uh, so um, primarily, as you actually see in most of the Mesolithic undergatherer settlements, you actually see um, very standard artifacts, most of them actually made of microblades. Um, uh, and then the core from which they are actually made, uh, they are abundant in the, at the site. Along with these microblades, you also do come across. Uh, the, in that, you, you do actually have, you know, geometric forms and non-geometric forms. And you also do have several bone implements. You can see some of them are bone points, shouldered bone points, and also uh, uh, where my cursor moves in the middle or in the top right hand corner. Uh, these three of them in the middle are in fact uh, 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 ochre crayons, yellow ochre, red ochre uh, crayon. So these are some of the artifacts you generally find in, I suppose, in most of the uh, the Mesolithic settlements um, uh, in Gujarat. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure this could be um, could quite similar in many other sites in our country. And in addition to that, we also do have some of this, uh, you know, grinding stones, or also sometimes known as ballad stones. These are flat, thin sandstone pieces, which are actually used for uh, food processing, also sometimes used for mixing colors. Um, uh, that's the way it has been actually interpreted. To some of them are actually found to be stained with color. Um, uh, uh, but then I suppose the main purpose was for food processing. Uh, that uh, that these are actually abundant in in, in many of these uh, the the microlithic site uh, uh, you know uh, the mesolithic sites. <clears throat> Along with that, you also do have some other cultural materials uh, like uh, dentalium shells. Um, uh, you know, dentalium shells. These are seashells. These are actually collected from the seashore, and then probably kind of uh, exchanged uh, uh, with the hinterlands, uh, um, uh, you know, this is around 30, 40 kilometers away from, I mean, uh, from the run of Kutch, you know, uh, uh, but then the sea is quite far away from here, but yet you do actually see it in the Gulf of Kutch, I suppose, quite far away. If the run of Kutch was not an arm of sea at that time, it doesn't look like it was an arm of sea very much. But anyway, you do come across them, suggesting that there was some very long distance interaction that has been happening even the Mesolithic times. Also this one, this is a bivalve shell. Uh, uh, most of the time they are actually found in the estuaries uh, where, uh, uh, yeah, uh, that, that generally the habitat of these uh, uh, bivalve shells. And then they are also found uh, uh, in the Mesolithic context. And curiously enough, you also have some small little piece which actually shows grinding and to some, uh, to some extent, polished little small pieces. Um, these are not uh, these are not the Neolithic uh, ground polished uh, tools. They are very tiny, as you can see, uh, five to six centimeters. These are uh, silt stone pieces, uh, kind of uh, uh, yeah, um, and uh, they are not uncommon. A similar kind of tiny piece was actually reported from another site nearby. Uh, Lang Naj, which is one of the one of the first Mesolithic sites excavated in our country, and this has actually led to a lot of um, controversy. Not controversies, a lot of dialogue among the prehistorians whether those ground tools would actually amount to the beginning of uh, Neolithic uh, Neolithic uh, uh, technology. Um, but then uh, this this is not anything very close to Neolithic technology. It's just a ground stone piece. 
um, then uh, there is very little distinction in the uh, uh, in as far as the microblade industry is actually concerned uh, at Lotte Shore uh, from the chalcolithic level. We have almost very similar set of artifacts from the from the chalcolithic level, um, uh, with a lot of grinding stones, and then in addition to that, we have a copper implements as you can actually see it in the slide. Um, uh, but in in the microblade Antarctica, you st still have all the geometric forms and non-geometric forms, and significantly enough, the crusted guiding grid technique, in fact, is actually found to be almost completely uh, uh, absent in, in, in thousands of artifacts which we actually kind of analyze. analyze. There, are, there is not a single actually kind of blade or the crusted ridge blade which has been found uh, from Rotteshwa. Uh, it is, it's obvious that you know, uh, probably these chalcolithic um, stone nappers were not acquainted with uh, the crusted guiding ridge technique. In, we are talking about 3,700. B, uh, BC or 3600 BC, which actually is uh, uh, pretty strange. Uh, um, uh, you know, you do actually come across crusted guiding grid technique being quite commonly practiced in the Harappan context. But then, probably in the early stages, uh, 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 this was not actually found in the at, at Lotteshwar in the Chalcolithic context. Now, um, we kind of uh, uh, we, we, uh, we we kind of uh, uh, looked at the uh, uh, you know uh, relative abundance of these micrograde elements in uh, in the Mesolithic and Chalcolithic context from Lotte Shore. Um, so you can actually see in the graph. Uh, what you can actually see is that um, there are more uh, uh, blade elements, both geometric tools or the non-geometric tools or even lithic debit In in general. Uh, the chalcolithic uh, assemblage is much uh, richer than the Mesolithic, uh, almost double in, in that sense, um, suggesting there is an intensification of artifact uh, production that actually happened, all coming from the one and the same trench. And the volume actually kind of, uh, uh, kind of volume kind of analyzed uh, uh, would in the Mesolithic would have been more than the chalcolithic. Um, uh, so uh, it certainly suggests what is known as, as a more what is known as more enhanced protection of stone implements during the chalcolithic than in the Mesolithic. That's all one can actually say. Um, it, it does not so show much about. Uh, uh, we we are not actually able to kind of find out any particular pattern in the in the behavior or, or in the distribution of blade elements. Microblade element between the Mesolithic and Chalcolithic, except the fact that there is a substantial increase in the in the overall increase in the uh, in the artifact uh, uh, microblade artifacts in the Chalcolithic. Um, uh, uh, almost a similar situation you actually come across in uh, the Athran Athrana East um, uh, a site, which is uh, located around uh, uh, 50, 60 kilometers uh, further northwest of Lotteshwar, as we have seen in the map. Um, that is a, that the, that's a site. Um, it's also on top of a very large sand dune. You have a number of Mesolithic sites that are actually located around, also Chalcolithic sites, um, uh, on most, on on almost all all those little sand dunes were actually at some point of time kind of occupied by the by the Mesolithic hunters and gatherers as well as the Chalcolithic. Uh, Communities. This one, in fact, was the one which we excavated. In fact, was one of the richest. And then we did actually come across almost very similar kind of uh, uh, situation uh, at uh, at Dathrana. Uh, what you can actually see in here is, uh, you know, once again very flimsy evidence of chalcolithic, something around about 50, uh, uh, 40 to 50 centimeters, not more than that. And they are actually found in clusters, as you can see in the strata, uh, a lot of bones and uh, innumerable. Uh, in Tatana, in fact, was, uh, was a uh, chalcolithic blade uh, uh, manufacturing settlements and very little actually Mesolithic uh, uh, occupational evidence has been found from the, uh, uh, from the site. There obviously are, uh, are there, but the, uh, uh, the major part of the artifact assemblages were actually found from the 
from the from the Chalcolithic uh, uh, levels, which has been dated to around 3,300 BC, whereas the Mesolithic one has been dated to around uh, 7,000 to 7,500 BC. Chalcolithic has been dated by radiocarbon uh, uh, charcoal, uh, and whereas the Mesolithic has been dated by using uh, a charred otolith from that level, going uh, from the Mesolithic level. So we have a um, very compatible date between uh, both, Meso uh, both uh, for the Mesolithic from Lotte Shore as well as the, as well as the, as well as from Dathrana. Dat so these are the, uh, the blade uh, artifacts, which you, uh, microblade artifacts, you can see that there are geometric forms, there are non-geometric forms, uh, um, uh, et cetera, along a uh, lot of these uh, cores. And here again, you have these uh, uh, grinding stones or palace stones, which are one of the um, one of the integral part of Mesolithic assemblage in 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 here. Um, um, and then you also have this red ochre uh, cryon, as you can see, where there is this uh, circled one is a red ochre cryon. Uh, so primarily, almost all those things which you come across at Lotteshwar were actually found at the site. Also, you have this little piece of a uh, a kind of, um, this is not a cryon, this is actually once again a stone piece, which has been, which shows facetting because of grinding. And these are the otoliths, which we actually found this, and some of them were actually found to be charred. And that is what uh, one of those charred, uh, 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 you know, otoliths coming from the Mesolithic level actually dates back to, oh, you know, very, very consistent date, 7,400 BC, 7,600 BC. Um, so suggesting that this was once again a site that was occupied in the middle of 8th millennium BC by Mesolithic hunters and gatherers. Um, when we come to the Chalcolithic level, you know, it is quite different from what you have seen at, uh, at, at Loteshwar. You know, Loteshwar, it is the same microblade industry which actually predominates. Now, that is not the case in here. In, at Dathrana, it is actually the long blades uh, which were actually primarily belong to the Chalcolithic level, or uh, the Harappan Chalcolithic level, because the artifacts which are found associated with these are also belong to the early Harappan, um, uh, dating back to 3300 BC or 3000 BC, either pre-Prabhat or early Harappan. These are actually dated to around 3000 BC, 3300 to 3000 BC. You can see these long, very regular blades which are produced by crested guiding grids. These are some of those Custard guide grinding ridge cores. Um, you know, the site, in fact, has uh, uh, hundreds of such custard guiding grid cores as well as blades. <clears throat> so there is very little comparison of the Chalcolithic assemblages, blade assemblages, which you come across at Lotishwar and at Dathrana. Uh, Dathrana, I suppose, actually employed the custard guiding grid technique. So you can actually see. Uh, production of large blades here. Uh, uh, microblades are very, very rare. You can see microblades are there, uh, which are actually still being actually used, but at the same time, they were actually using larger blades, the so chalcolithic blades uh, for, you know, uh, chalcolithic uh, 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 food processing. Uh, the last site, in fact, is the Wacherwood Timpo. Uh, as I said, this is uh, one of the sites primarily belonging to the uh, Mesolithic. We selected this uh, because, you know, in both the other site, sites, uh, uh, we thought that there is always a possibility of contamination of the Mesolithic and the Chalcolithic, because this is, uh, these are sites which are actually located on top of the sand dunes. The surface is always quite loose. So um, <clears throat> the artifacts which are left behind by a previous occupation can actually get mixed with the later occupation because of this loose uh, surface, uh, you know. Uh, uh, so uh, it was very difficult to actually kind of uh, have a control over this mixing up of this artifact. So we therefore actually selected this site, primarily think that this is a, this is a one period site belongs to the Mesolithic, and which actually is true, but then you do come across some flimsy evidence of uh, uh, what is known as a very little, as you see here. Uh, uh, in certain pockets you come across it being occupied by the uh, the, the early Harappans. Uh, uh, and and uh, the Mesolithic here has been actually dated to 5,600 BCE. You also do come across some small pits here. These pits, in fact, are the 
the pits most probably dug by the, those early Harappans. Uh, um, so, um, but then <clears throat> no early Harappan material, in fact, was actually found uh, from none of these pits, actually. Uh, the early Harappan um, habitation evidence at the site was actually um, uh, marked by a few burials. We actually did come across a burial at the site where uh, in, in another trench, not in, not in this trench. Okay, this is actually the, the Mesolithic artifacts which we have uh, from that, uh, from Bahurbo Timbo, very, very rich, as you can actually see. Um, um, uh, um, the study, I mean, the study of these microlithic assemblages actually still on, I suppose, very uh, uh, shortly it will actually be finished, completed. So you can actually see um, the same kind of geometric, non geometric artifacts, a lot of different kind of cores and also bone implements and then grinding stones once again, actually kind of a large, large number of grinding stones actually uh, uh, from the same site, suggesting the grinding stone essentially suggests uh, uh, enhanced increased foot processing, which is part and parcel of the, uh, which is what we associate with the Mesolithic uh, hunters and gatherers just before the food producing way of life. Um, uh, uh, so we also have other cultural materials like uh, several red ochre and also manganese dioxide, uh, red and yellow ochre pieces, which showing showing the uh, you know uh, the evidence of grinding, um, and also personal uh, dental EM shells ornament ornaments. Uh, these are the kind of ornaments we generally come across uh, in, in, in the Mesolithic context. So primarily, you know, all the Mesolithic sites uh, in, the, in the Mesolithic habitation, the sites which we excavated, they kind of yielded a very similar kind of, uh, uh, kind of artifacts. Um, the, uh, it does not actually kind of tell us much about, uh, you know, the hunting, uh, how the hunting and gathering way of life, I suppose, transformed into food producing way of life. Um, and so we actually therefore looked at the Mesolithic and the uh, uh, Chalcolithic uh, faunal collection for understanding the hunting and gathering way of life. Uh, so <clears throat> along with uh, you know, all these artifacts, we also do come across um, uh, you know, a large number of um, animals, those who were hunted uh, primarily, uh, that is in the Mesolithic context. Uh, as you can see, and it's based on uh, mostly, uh, you know, uh, the mammals, uh, both the large and small mammals, large archaeodactyles or uh, medium-sized archaeodactyles. Archeodact um, um, and also you do come across the, the large number of grinding stones, as I say, in the Mesolithic context at Lotteshwar 1 trend, yes, more than 140 uh, such grinding stones. The Chalcolithic, it is 193. Uh, so what you can see is that the continuation of the process, uh, you know, uh, uh, of food processing uh, in, uh, between the Mesolithic and the Chalcolithic. In addition to this, uh, you know, uh, in the faunal, uh, uh, the faunal collection also included uh, uh, otoliths. These are, you know, um, there are a number of fish remains uh, which were also found, fish vertebrae, which we actually came across. Not number, very few actually, but then. We have uh, we have a lot of these uh, otoliths. Um, uh, uh, these are in, you know ear stones which are actually found in the fish bony fishes, and they are actually quite abundantly found in all the three sites in the Mesolithic, uh, as well as to some extent Chalcolithic level. Uh, so there are some distinction in that. We'll come to that point a little later. Um, so Mesolithic uh, economy uh, was based on hunting and fishing coupled with food gathering. That is, that is for certain, you do have large number of grinding stones which suggest extensive food processing by grinding and pounding. Uh, so you have uh, the other side, uh, uh, the Wahurwo Timpo, um, you know, the, you can see the kind of fragmentation happened to this, uh, these uh, animal bones. But then, you know, if you take off all those things, you still have a few identifiable pieces, which once again, actually are pretty similar to what we actually come across at Loteshwar. You have both uh, medium as well as uh, small size archaeodactyles and, uh, you know, hoofed animals primarily. Um, and then you have uh, a few large, large, uh, large archaeodactyles as well. And all 
also also the outlets uh, uh, this very similar kind of outlets we actually come across at wahar wakimbo all from the all primarily from the mesolithic context um so <clears throat> what is the what is the, uh, the 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 distribution of these animals between the chalcolithic and the and the mesolithic um uh, in the mesolithic what you actually see uh, we have uh, this is the distribution chart of the uh, two different layers of the uh, the mesolithic what we have is uh, the, the the whole faunal collection in fact is actually kind of uh, uh, predominated by black bucks you know um uh, which is almost as you can actually see some 80% or even uh, yeah very close to 80% uh, 80 85% you have a few gazelles um in both the layers and then other animals like uh, you also have a uh, 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 wild buffalo uh, very few in number um and uh, and uh, and and also a few neil guy uh, blue bull um you know uh, in the in, in the mesolithic level uh, and there are no evidence of cattle except very few cat there you can see this color this is cattle cattle was is not actually been seen and there is no evidence of sheep and goat wild sheep and goat or uh, wild cattle bones are actually uh uh in the in the case of sheep and goat it is almost completely absent in the case of wild cattle they have five bones uh, from the mesolithic context okay uh, when we come to the chalcolithic we actually come across fully domesticated cattle uh fully domesticated cattle and also you have uh, you have uh, uh, bobalus uh, that is uh, that is uh, buffalo and with some amount of sheep very little obvious is sheep and uh, and neil guy and still what you actually see in this uh, chalcolithic level dating back to 3600 bc black buck actually still predominates uh, so uh, a major part uh, of the food intake was actually kind of contributed by uh, you know the uh, 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 the wild fauna uh, whereas you actually have uh, uh, the cattle rearing cattle herding actually happening uh, uh, at at uh, loteshwar as early as 3700 bc uh, in a, remember these are all fully domesticated ones so you can uh, this is what you can actually see uh, this is the, this is the uh, 7500 5500 bc uh, context we have uh, uh, wild cattle bones we have just five of them actually been found from the from the side uh, and then you can actually see this is this is the size of those uh, 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 in a wild cattle phalanx uh, phalanxes which is actually found from the from from the mesolithic context when we come to chalcolithic and there is substantial reduction in the size as you can actually see uh, around 4000 bc um, so uh, there appears to be a, you know uh, you know the question is that is the responsibility of uh, local event of domestication um uh, one cannot completely rule that out but uh, uh you know in such cases we actually come across much more uh, uh, you know intense exploitation of cattle in the mesolithic time uh, that is not actually quite apparent uh, in the mesolithic context you know what you actually see in the mesolithic context is uh, you know they were actually kind of depending selectively hunting most probably black buck and that actually continues even in the chalcolithic times or the early farming communities whereas uh, uh, there appears to be cattle uh, wild cattle very few most probably they were probably hunted and that is what is actually reflected by the presence of this uh, you know uh, the phalanxes um, just just the, uh, uh, two of them actually uh, uh, in the in the mesolithic context and then you have in the in the chalcolithic context you have the uh, fully domesticated cattle um, suggesting most probably this cattle was actually introduced in the fully domesticated format uh, from somewhere outside but at the same time one cannot completely rule out the possibility of local event of domestication i suppose that is something one has to actually kind of investigate more thoroughly Uh, in north gujarat and adjoining uh, adjoining areas so there is a possibility of local domestication um so the faunal record therefore actually says uh, uh, 
that there could be a possibility of uh, mesolithic hunters and gatherers taking steps towards domestication, which is not completely kind of attested by the archaeological record, just suggestions, but not completely attested by. So um, what we also see is, um, I was talking about this autolith. These autoliths, these are the kind of autoliths which we actually came across in the, uh, both in the, all the three sides. Uh, as you can see, this actually ranges from 7,000 BC to 3,000 3, BC. And this actually belongs to both, uh, both the sea fish. This one, what you see uh, uh, the, at the top right-hand corner one, uh, what we call the, that, that's freshwater one. And this one, uh, the catfish, which one, which in fact is a sea fish, which is actually found from Lotus, from Datrana. That, Datrana, if you remember, is very close to the, to, to the, the, uh, the, uh, the little run of uh, uh, Kutch. And then uh, I suppose that probably is the habitat of the catfish. So they could easily be accessed by the Mesolithic community and the Chalcolithic community. Whereas um, uh, uh, the Lotasia probably was actually depending upon the interdunal depressions or the riverine fishes, uh, which are actually found in the hinterlands. So you actually come across this uh, uh, Chanidae that is generally in, in, in common, common language known as uh, snake heads. Um, or the, uh, in here you come across both. This is the Chanidae and then that is the Aridae, that is the, that is the catfish. So uh, these are uh, interesting uh, because we actually did a, uh, uh, since these are calcium carbonate concretions, one can actually carry out a, a series of, uh, you know, uh, they can actually be used for understanding the paleo uh, environmental changes, especially the temperature variation, because, um, you know, the calcium carbonate, uh, uh, we can actually do isotope studies of oxygen as well as carbon in order to understand this, um, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the temperature variation or temperature uh, regime in which the fish were actually kind of living, which will help us to understand the environmental features of that time, which we actually did in collaboration. This has been actually published uh, in collaboration with the uh, uh, Research Institute for Humanity and Nature uh, with the Japanese uh, uh, collaboration and um, and this has already been published. Um, uh, so um, uh, that is exactly what uh, this, is, this study was actually done in collaboration, as you can see, autoliths and oxygen carbon isotope studies. This was done in collaboration with uh, the. Uh, so um, uh, after actually looking at the. Uh, the faunal remains actually collected from Lotteshur and other sites. Um, what actually is the situation? Does the Mesolithic faunal collection at Lotteshur show steps leading towards food production? Um, uh, uh, what we actually can understand is that we have evidence of intense food processing in the form of, uh, uh, in the form of, um, you know, a uh, large number of grinding stones. And there is also selective hunting of antelopes probably uh, intense hunting activity is actually kind of, these are the, these are the set of evidence which we actually come across in the Mesolithic. So those, you know, the, the hunters and gatherers, those who imme uh, immediately uh, preceded food producing way of life, they actually kind of uh, tried to expand their food base or by intensification of uh, um, uh, extract, uh, environmental resource extraction. So selective hunting, in fact, was one of the uh, strategies employed by these, you know, you know, Mesolithic hunters and gatherers in order to, in order to maintain the food supply. Um, uh, and then you also have the uh, wild ancestors of potential domesticates, which are present. When I say potential domesticates, this is cattle. No sheep and goat bones wild are actually found for any one of the Mesolithic sites so far in Gujarat. Um, uh, uh, so there is no question of one can actually kind of uh, domesticate sheep and goat because their wild form domesticates, uh, potential domesticates are not available for domestication. Cattle, probably they were there, but then there are no real evidence uh, uh, at the moment from Lotteshua or other sites which we investigated suggesting a local, uh, uh, you know, uh, domestication actually ha happen happening. But that doesn't mean that there will be other sites in the region which would actually probably illustrate or demonstrate that process, possibility of local, local domestication, therefore cannot actually be ruled out. 
Now, the, the most important thing now is that what is the status of uh, planned food exploitation? That is what where we uh, might come across some interesting evidence about how exactly you know the mesolithic hunters and gatherers kind of exploited the the the, the uh, edible plant food items which are available in the in the landscape uh, um, and does that actually show uh, any evidence of diversification uh, for which we actually kind of uh, looked at the evidence of charcoal density uh, you know uh, in the in the mesolithic uh, sediment mesolithic context as well as in the charcoal context we do, we could not actually find uh, any any interesting pattern in that in fact there isn't much charcoal at all in the mesolithic suggesting that they were actually kind of manipulating the landscape by using fire etc so that was that was not seen in any one of our excavations but then we have our most of our evidence about the plant exploitation actually comes from the macro faunal remains as well as the microfaunal remains which include the phytolith studies and then residue studies that includes the starch grain analysis we also did actually carry out some of the ethnographic studies to understand the processing of and management managing of these resources by probably the hunters and gatherers or the early agriculturalists. What we uh, 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 the set of data the set of data for the, uh, for the uh, the floral studies actually were collected from uh, from uh, from the samples soil samples which are actually uh, floated. We have actually floated more than twenty thousand liters of soil from uh, almost each site. Uh, through flotation for collecting charred macro remains and uh, 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 macro remains of the plant food, you know, and then um, this was actually kind of analyzed. And unfortunately, for some reason, you know, um, um, the, the the rate of preservation, uh, the state of preservation, in many of these macro remains are actually found very very poor for some reason in North, most of the sites in North Gujarat. It has been explained that because of the salinity in water, uh, many a times these uh, uh, charred macro remains actually kind of disintegrate um, in the process of in the process of separating them out. Um, uh, uh, that could have been one of the reason. But uh, the fact remains that there are very few uh, uh, actual evidence of uh, you know re relatively much less actual evidence of. Uh, macro remains uh, from the um, both Mesolithic as well as the Chalcolithic context uh, uh, in North Gujarat. Um, so these were um, uh, what you can actually see is that uh, uh, these are some of those uh, uh, macro remains which we have. Uh, most of these actually you have uh, you know charred uh, job tears, Sacrimona uh, koi croics. Uh, coics, um, both charred as well as uncharred one were actually collected uh, in the excavation, both from the Mesolithic level as well as from the as well as from the uh, the as well as from the Chalcolithic level or the early farming farming levels. So uh, what you can what you can actually see is that this actually include mostly millets, uh, small millets like the Bracaria ramosa, Cetaria pumila, uh, Echinocola colona. So these are some uh, different varieties of uh, 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 millets, small millets, which are actually collected from the Mesolithic, as well as from the uh, Chalcolithic context, mostly from the Chalcolithic context. context. And then you also have, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 my, microtylema, uh, that is a uh, horse gram. Um, and also see some uh, wild as well as domesticated ones uh, uh, from uh, uh, Loteshwar as well as Wahar Timpo, that is from the, the Mesolithic context as well as from the Chalcolithic context. So uh, the, the, what is interesting is that uh, most of this, uh, uh, the charred macros actually indicated, uh, uh, indicated the exploitation of uh, locally available uh, uh, millet, millet groups and also some of the local uh, pulses like uh, microtylema uniflorum or and also uh, uh, you know see some seeds both wild as well as uh, uh, and you do also come with domesticated um, uh, we also have but it's not as um, uh, you know uh, <clears throat> excuse me 
uh, some of this uh, uh, spiklets uh, 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 of the, you know, this one, in fact, what you actually see, in fact, is the Atsisam uh, Malabarigam. This is from the Wahrabur Temple going back to 5600 BC. Uh, that I suppose is the wild form, not actually uh, domesticated. Um, and then you also have uh, uh, split, spiklet bases, and most of these actually uh, are of uh, are of Poaceae, as well as uh, uh, yeah, most as you can see, these Poaceae uh, grasses, as well as the uh, as well as the grains, food grains, and then uh, uh, from. From Datrana, uh, 3300 3, BC context, that is the Chalcolithic context, you also, one can also see um, um, uh, uh, dependence on uh, you know uh, local uh, plant food, plant food items that is what actually dominated. But you also have hordum uh, species, uh, probably that of uh, the spiklet of of barley. You know, body of obviously is a northwestern, you know, uh, grain which is actually uh, cultivated uh, in, in 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 this valley. So what you can actually see is that uh, this certainly indicate uh, the introduction of this mill, uh, the, the barley, and probably wheat as well. We actually have uh, uh, some evidence of wheat also, rare evidence of wheat also from Rotteshwa uh, in the later stage, uh, suggesting that. Uh, uh, you know, uh, these food grains were actually introduced in due course of time, um, uh, uh, but very, very rare, but mo ma major dependence, in fact, was actually local, uh, local millets. Um, uh, apart from the charred grains, we also actually uh, 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 looked at the uh, phytolites, uh, 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 Residues, uh, uh, phytolis as well as starch, and the uh, samples which are used for this purpose, in fact, was uh, grinding stones uh, from both Mesolithic and early Chalcolithic context. Uh, you know, uh, these are ideal, uh, you know, material for actually kind of extracting, extracting, uh, you know, uh, both phytolis and starch grains uh, um, uh, because they are actually used for food processing. And then, therefore, um, um, you know, it is logical to think that uh, some of those uh, residues will be caught in the uh, little pores and cracks and crevices of the, the grind, grinding stone, which can be extracted and then studied. And uh, for this, uh, for phytolith and starch residue studies, um, you know, uh, uh, 10 grinding stones were actually kind of initially selected. Uh, and then in that um, uh, five actually belong to the Mesolithic uh, deposit and five from uh, the, um, the another Chalcolithic deposit. Um, and then for the residue analysis, uh, you know, for this purpose, uh, to, 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 we also did some, some kind of controlled uh, sampling in order to see that, you know, uh, uh, these were, uh, you know, the, the grinding stones also actually a kind of, uh, you know, contaminated by the by the phytolis which are actually present in the soil. So in order to rule out that, you know, we actually did some four controlled sample from both the contest to, to, to make sure that they are actually dealing with uh, uh, the, the, the phytolis which are actually, and also phytolis and the starch with this residues belong to the mesolithic or the chalcolithic contest itself. Okay. Um, so uh, residues extracted for both phytolis and, and also starch analysis. Um, so, so this has been actually the, the main body of work which has been actually carried out by uh, Huang Ho, one of the team members um, uh, uh, of our, our No Gap. And then what you can actually see then also been published. Uh, uh, so you can see that uh, 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 most of these uh, uh, actually comes from uh, 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 Panicoid, panicum, as well as the poese, these are all grasses or which are actually belong to the, the, the millet family as well as the, uh, the food grain family that is, you know, uh, the wheat, rice, all those things actually fall into that poese. Uh, so not only from the food grains, but also sometimes you come across, uh, uh, or come across phytolids of leaves uh, of that plant, suggesting that uh, in these plants were uh, one way or the other, either the food grains 
or the leaves were kind of processed uh, on these on on these grinding stones. Um, uh, uh, that is what this the presence of this phytolage actually indicates. And so these are essentially local local variety of uh, uh, plants, uh, uh, suggesting what is known as uh, uh, you know uh, suggesting local exploitation um, uh, by the hunters and gatherers and also early Chalcolithic communities. So what we actually come across is mostly grasses, in particular panicoids and weeds. Um, you know, these are and phytoliths from leaves and cones of grasses, suggesting different uh, uh, processing uh, uh, processing of different plant items on these grinding stones. And we also have, uh, interestingly, a banana leaf phytolith coming from the chalcolithic contest, uh, which is very strange. Banana, uh, of course, banana is reported from the early Harappan context in in, in uh, from Kodiji in Pakistan, um, but then bananas do not actually grow in this region. It's not a native plant in North Gujarat. Uh, so that is what we actually came across in one of those uh, uh, grinding stones. And we also did kind of a Uh, uh, starch grain analysis, um, uh, uh, which also indicated these are the starch grains, which also indicated the, the presence of uh, panicoidae, uh, faboidae, and triticacea. This includes many of those millet grasses, or the or, or also the pulses, as well as uh, as well as the wheat, uh, uh, etc. Uh, et uh, from the from the starch grain analysis. Uh, suggesting that different crops were actually kind of uh, processed uh, at the site, uh, which includes uh, a lot of millets and rarely, and also uh, also uh, also the pulses and rarely triticacea, that is uh, either wheat or barley starch, barley as well. Yeah, I suppose. I suppose um, also, some of this millet, you also have, uh, uh, you know, uh, starch grains of uh, 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 of 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 uh, uh, millet that is probably uh, sorghum, and also this pulse, uh, uh, one of the pulses. Uh, one does not know which pulses and start grain. And this has been actually, as I said, this has been actually published. Um, so one can actually have a look at it if anyone of you are actually interested. So I I, I will come back to this. Uh, uh, you know uh, what therefore actually see is that uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, the early stages of food production primarily uh, uh, or agropastoral way of life primarily actually kind of practicing exploitation of locally available millet and other edible grasses and other other edible pulses and seeds and you also do come across at least in the later stages 3300 BC the introduction or the uh, the, the appearance of uh, the barley as well as wheat and um, and also herding of cattle. Uh, 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 that probably is the, the primary aspect of the, uh, uh, the early agropastoral economy. And evidence of this, uh, evidence of uh, uh, how, how exactly they actually manage these resources actually came from these pits as well. If we can actually see this, uh, uh, you know, um, as I said, the child quality habitation at Lord Peshwar is actually kind of um, characterized by, by a large number of pits. And these pits probably were actually used as storage pits. You now we actually did carry out the white lining you actually see at the bottom is in fact, you know, compressed phytoliths. And these are actually of mostly of the grasses, which are actually used, uh, uh, you know, at the bottom of this, uh, of the pit in order before they actually kind of you know, filled this with probably with the grains in uh, uh, you know, a temporary basis. When you know uh, what probably would have happened is that uh, uh, during the harvesting season, where the where the, the where this millet must have been actually growing in the natural habitat in the interdunal depressions, and then the hunters and gatherers, as well as the uh, the early agri agropastoralists, would actually kind of harvest them, and they will probably store them in these in these in these in these uh, underground uh, pits. Uh, which was probably lined with uh, the grasses, um, you, you know. Um, uh, and then this is a temporary kind of arrangement. And then uh, it, it, they will actually move on once the, once, the, once the region 
is no more, uh, you know, in the, in the summer season, they actually move on. And it is in the winter or in the monsoon, they actually come back to kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, in, the, in the winter, they actually come back to kind of harvest those, uh, those, uh, those millets and the locally, local pulses, which are actually kind of uh, available in the, in the landscape. Now, um, um, so this essentially suggests the, the internal, uh, you know, stimuli that is how under hunters and gatherers actually kind of manage the resources uh, um, in the uh, uh, in North Gujarat, and then uh, there are also some interesting evidence about. Uh, <coughs> Sorry, that battery went down. I need to plug it to the main. I'm sorry. So uh, we have uh, um, the external stimuli uh, for the hunting and undergather transition. Um, uh, you know, what evidence do we have to understand this? You know, what kind of uh, uh, stimuli actually come from outside? For that, we actually have to look at the other cultural remains of early farming community. Uh, you know, um, the, what are the other side sort of evidence which we have? We have uh, a lot of ceramics from Loteshwar dating back to 3600 or 3700 BC onwards. Uh, uh, these are the main type of uh, uh, identifiable trees you actually come across. Uh, they are actually handmade or uh, turntable made. There is no evidence of fast wheel which you actually come across at the site. And they are actually kind of uh, showing a kind of totally different kind of painting, which is quite alien to the urban harap. And so that is what actually helps you to kind of identify this as a local tradition, uh, which is confined to this region. But the, what is interesting is that uh, the patterns which we actually come across, uh, 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 the painting uh, and pattern which we actually come across actually show close similarities or uh, with what you actually come across in the upper Indus region. And what I mean to say is it is a lot of similarities with uh, especially the paintings which you come across in the early Harappan context in the upper Indus region, um, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the Revi Basin, uh, in the early levels at Harappa, as well as the neighboring uh, sites, especially the painting style, as well as some of the vessel forms uh, uh, at the 3600 BC. And you also do have, uh, you know, uh, terracotta beads, but also a few stone beads as well as uh, shell beads. Also, a uh, lot of terracotta, uh, uh, you know, objects which which is part and parcel of the early chalcolithic uh, assemblage, cultural assemblage. But what is also interesting is these uh, uh, these what we call the terracotta human figures. Um, this is this one is from Loteshwar and Nagwada. Um, uh, you know, you can actually see the very minimalistic in style, and uh, which is very different from what you actually come across in the Harappan context. But then it actually shows a lot of similarity with the similar kind of terracotta forms, which you, which which has been actually reported from the uh, the upper Indus basin, like in the Banu basin. You can see them the, this illustration, suggesting there is there appears to be some kind of uh, uh, similarity shared, they probably kind of uh, uh, shared the, uh, sh some features are actually shared between the, the early Chalcolithic uh, uh, settlement at Loteshwar and in the Banu Basin, suggesting some kind of interaction probably that existed between the two. Uh, that probably is the reason you actually come across the similarity in the other cultural assemblages. All right. And then uh, uh, more interesting evidence actually come uh, slightly later in time, going back to around 3,300 BC from Lotesh, um, from Datrana, uh, early Harappan contest. You know, you have, as I said, this this uh, this is a, a factory site for blade production, Datrana, uh, where you can see these are the local blades. Along with these local blades, you also do come across Rohri chert blades. 
uh, these, these blades obviously has to come from the middle interest, from the raw vehicles. So that actually is a concrete evidence of the interaction that existed from 3300 BC. But, and then it is at that context, you actually come across a lot of these very interesting, very, very, uh, you know, uh, 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 primitive looking beads actually also become part and parcel of this, uh, the early Chalcolithic settlements in this region. It's the, these are the early Harappans actually already, yeah, uh, uh, we call it early Harappan. We should call it uh, early Harappan because you do actually come up to early Harappan pottery as well in this context. Um, so uh, these blades were also produced for the first time by by using crested guiding grid technique. So you have this interesting evidence of crested guiding grid technique actually coming from Loteshwar, uh, sorry, from Dathrana. Um, so it appears that the crusted guiding grid technique actually were introduced by the early Harappan, those who were actually coming from the Middle Indus. Um, uh, and um, you know, you do not come across uh, uh, this actually reflected at Loteshwar going back to 3600 BC. Uh, and no, uh, no, no chert blades of or no uh, rockery chert blades were actually found. No uh, crusted guiding grid technique blades were actually found from Loteshwar. Uh, going back to 3600, 700 BC. Uh, uh, whereas you come across the, all of them in, in Datrana uh, around 3300 BC, suggesting that, you know, the interaction become more concrete around 3300 BC, uh, and that actually resulted into transference of, uh, of this uh, crusted guiding grid technique in, in, in Gujarat for the first time around 3300 or 3000 BC. Uh, you know, uh, this, this, uh, this, Evidence for the interaction with the early Harappans is actually kind of confirmed by the presence of this, uh, the burials which we actually come, at, which we actually came across at uh, Waharwar Timbo. Uh, this is one of those burials which we came across at Waharwar Timbo, and this was the, the person was actually found buried with uh, two pods. These pods were actually found to be very similar to the kind of pods which we come across in the early Harappan sites in, in the Indus Valley, in in, in Sindh especially. And, um, and, and those vessels, vessels which we come across along with these were also found from Datrana. These are the, those kind of vessels. And these vessels, uh, uh, Datrana along with those, those crusted guiding grid blades and, uh, and other evidence of, uh, uh, you know, uh, chalcolithic uh, habitation, hunter-gatherer habitation, uh, chalcolithic agro-pastoral habitation. Um, and, and what you uh, what you can actually see is that um, uh, uh, these pottery, in fact, are also uh, wheel made. The, so uh, they are not actually handmade. So uh, uh, the, the earliest of the wheel made pottery actually is of this early Harappan pottery you come across in Gujarat. You know, prior to this, they were all actually kind of handmade or slow wheel made pottery. So the, the early Harappans actually introduced not only the, the, the crusted guiding technique probably, uh, and also the, the fast wheel. Uh, from this time onwards, you actually come across very well-made fast wheel, very well-made pottery made on fast wheel in Gujarat. And then when they actually came, they also probably met, and you, you actually can see that the, these, these are actually found, several burials of this kind are actually found in North Gujarat. So suggesting this external stimuli of farming probably uh, uh, was there, which was essentially coming from the early Harappan con uh, uh, contest dating back to 3300 BC or even earlier than that. The, the process of uh, 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 an early farming community actually kind of expanding the uh, geographical limit from the Indus to, towards the south must have actually happened much earlier than that. You actually come across the manifestation of that uh, very clearly from 3300 BC onwards. These are some of those burials which we actually have in North Gujarat showing similar kind of pottery uh, uh, which are distributed uh, uh, in North Gujarat as well as in Kutch, suggesting the widespread expansion of this uh, 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 early Harappan uh, along with the, what is known as the, uh, the farming uh, and chalcolithic way of life in, in, in Gujarat. Um, so to, to Kind of to, uh, to kind of sum up, what we can actually see is that uh, the beginning of agro-pastoral way of life in North Gujarat appears to be a result of enhanced exploitative strategies devised by the local population. That is what we actually probably we, uh, 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 
have seen that primarily the hunters and gatherers and the charcoal, early charcoal the communities were actually exploiting locally available millets and other edible grasses, et cetera. And also exploiting local animals, you know, wild animals. And then, uh, and the domesticated animals were introduced uh, somewhere around the uh, 3000 BC uh, or later in the early Chalcolithic, 3700 3, BC or later. Uh, in the early Chalcolithic community, and there is a possibility of it being uh, locally, uh, you know, it, domestication would have actually happened lo uh, locally, but then the evidence for that is actually not very concrete at the moment. It appears that, you know, uh, uh, by this time, uh, the early farming communities from the Indus, or early Chalcolithic communities from the in this valley is already impinging upon the uh, 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 on Gujarat, and that would have actually that interaction would have actually kind of resulted into the adoption of the new technologies of farming as well as uh, uh, you know adopting domesticated uh, animals into into the early farming communities. But it's also you need to actually understand that uh, goat domesticated goat actually come uh, the presence of domesticated goat actually happens only after 3300 bc no domesticated goats are actually found at rotation you have some evidence of domesticated sheep so it is the cattle domestication which we actually come across the early uh, early the uh, the early context um, whereas the sheep and goat were actually kind of uh, introduced uh, uh, later so uh, so this, uh, you know, the local process of domestication or the agro-pastoralism was actually kind of aided and abetted by the introduction of domesticated cattle, Neolithic and cop there is also copper, you know, copper implements, uh, etc. from outside. Um, and, and obviously the, the early Harappan farming technology certainly was much, much, much more advanced, much better than the uh, local farming uh, technology. So uh, that, in fact, is the, uh, uh, the end. I would actually kind of um, uh, 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 you know, my acknowledgement, thank um, all these different agencies, Department of Archaeology, MS University of Baroda, um, and the No Gap team. Um, all uh, you know, Marco, Carla, um, uh, and uh, uh, Huang Hu. Uh, Francis, Charu, and Rajesh, uh, a team which actually kind of investigated, uh, you know, uh, the beginning of farming way of life in North Gujarat, and also uh, the the members of the Indus project by Rim, uh, Osada, Akinori, um, Taramura, and Dosan, etc. And we were also kind of in the process, in, in many, uh, you know, uh, many a times we were actually kind of, uh, we did actually receive help from the University of Wisconsin, especially uh, uh, Arthur Noyo, Rod Chase and Randall Low. And uh, the permission for excavation, uh, we're grateful to uh, Arthur Survey of India, uh, State Department of Archaeology, and also very special thanks to all our students and fellow researchers were actually part of the study.